Hello? Hey, hey. Hey. How are you, man? Not bad. How are you? Good. Good to see you. You as well. When's the last time? Um, honestly, you know what? Uh, high school? So long. So long, yeah. High school and even in some of my questions here, I was just kind of looking at some of the stuff uh, at the beginning here to get into. Um, well, I might as well introduce you off the bat. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sheridan College, Bachelor Honors, Athletic Therapy, University of Guelph, uh, Bachelor in Science, Human Kinetics, yeah. um, Athletic Therapist, born and raised in Sault Ste. Marie, Massage Therapist, worked in the CFL, OHL, AHL, and NHL. Yeah. James Borelli. Hi. Me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for no, being no, here, no man. Problem. My pleasure. This is awesome. So, brother, we were just talking about when the last time we would have seen each other is, or um, how we know each other, I guess, uh, to okay. begin with. Yeah. And um, it's growing Sousse up Marie. hockey. Sault Ste. Yeah. Marie. So, growing up hockey. That's it. In the Sioux. So, um, to start off, because I what what this podcast is for me is kind of like the journey, a yeah. little bit of people's lives kind of thing. I'm interested in that. So um, remind me, I know what my experiences were like. We played on yeah. some of the same teams, I yeah. think probably maybe three or four times. You were a goalie, uh, weren't you? Yeah. If I recall, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. and um, we played on each other's teams uh, like three or four times, I think for full years. And then obviously I don't know if you remember if like at the beginning of every year you would have kind of like your practice squad team and and the, they would draft and everything like that yeah i remember yeah, we always like, tried right. exactly and i remember we ended up uh we were just around each other a lot at those yeah. like there was a couple people i remember that uh mm -hmm. we all kind of grew up together playing hockey so what do you remember sure. at that age growing up uh playing hockey in the sioux hockey was, was everything for everyone it seemed like anyways i don't know in our town uh i remember just going to the rink early mornings and it was everything that's what you talked about at school that's what you you did on the weekends or it was your life essentially whether whether you were good or not it was it, it felt like it was your life in our hometown that might be different than wherever you go but uh, i remember playing on your team i think one of the teams was prudential it just comes to my mind that's all, all i know you were goalie that's that's it it was long ago like we're old <laughs> Um, just the arenas come to mind. Like, do you remember going to those arenas? McNeekin, oh, yeah. Rankin. McNeekin, Rhodes, Rankin. We Did you go to the Pee Wee that much? Yeah, exactly. No, so. we're in SRHA. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally separate group. So strength and conditioning. I remember Ooh. doing a lot of that um, hockey schools growing up. Did you do the same? Were you in all those kind of hockey schools and everything? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You do that what, like a couple of weeks during the summer. It's crazy to see, now that you mention it, those are so much more than what they are. Like today, they're a lot more involved. More people do them more often. It's kind of crazy. When we were kids, it was basically like you had a week or so in the summer and now it's like a summer school or other talky school kind of thing. So. Right. Now I can imagine it's, uh, it could be probably much more intense. Absolutely. Everyone thinks their kid's going to the NHL, right? So. Did you play reps at all? I played rep for two, one or two seasons. And then my parents gave me the talk. Basically, like, you're good, sure, whatever. But you're not going to go anywhere in hockey. So cut down on all the travel time and all the time at the rink and whatever. They just made me come to reality, I guess. I don't know. And I was okay with it. So I, I did play. I played for two seasons. So I, I had enough of that after that. So reps, I remember at that younger age, is still kind of like amping you up a little bit for the strengthening and conditioning. I remember yeah. I had friends who did reps and they were constantly uh, training and everything. And I was like, holy God, like, I guess that's the difference. Yeah, you would have probably more more ice time throughout the week, more practice time, then you'd have dry land training and stuff like that too. And then you're you would have tournaments almost every weekend or, or stuff like that, close to home, whatever, away, all the above. 
So it's, it's intense. When did you realize that you wanted to get into the sports aspect of what you're doing? Uh, early, uh, mid high school, I tore my ACL. You're going to hear this from any therapist that they have like an injury and that kind of leads them down a certain path. But honest to God, it, I had an ACL tear. I had to get months of rehab after surgery, missed the season of hockey. Um, and I just, I liked the aspect of it going there almost every day at the start and then kind of like off and on and, and rehabbing and working towards a goal. And I knew it wasn't going to play hockey for a career. I had no, my talent level obviously not good enough. So if I wanted to stay in sports, which I really, really did, uh, that was, I knew that was my best kind of route to take. So I kind of went from there. That's interesting. That's interesting. So it's actually sparked from an injury. Correct. So an injury, I went to physiotherapy. That's pretty much all there was in the Sioux. Um, so I looked into being a physiotherapist. We're not much, I'm an athletic therapist, minor differences, but we, we both rehab uh, injuries to an end, an end goal. And, and I chose athletic therapy um, because they're more prominent in sports teams. You find them on every sports team, whether it's football, soccer, hockey, whatever. So if I knew I wanted to stay in sports, like I mentioned earlier, and do some sort of sports medicine, therapy, whatever, that was kind of what I should be looking into. And you said, uh, you're pretty lucky. You said it was kind of like mid high school for yourself that you realized that you wanted to do what you want to do and work in sports, right? Yeah, I remember in careers in grade 10, I think we all took that. We had to do an assignment. Um, we had to choose three uh, possible choices where you would want to go into. And I remember I chose athletic therapy, uh, physiotherapy, and chiropractor. And you had to write up like what their salary is, what their outlook is, what schooling they need, so on, so on, and do some research on that. So I chose those three. And ended up being one of those sweet so you guys focus on i was doing some research on what you do and you focus on injury prevention um exercise prescription strength and conditioning and nutrition regimens all of that stuff yeah and well re the rehabilitation too is big so right. especially at especially at the level I'm at now, the, the strength and conditioning and nutrition is is handled by a separate department essentially. Whereas that if I was in the OHL when I was there, I was the strength coach too and the therapist. But now with my job, I'm just therapist. So it's injury prevention, uh, rehabilitation when they do get injured, um, and then illnesses and stuff like that too. So medications or doctor referrals, stuff like that. Okay, so let's, um, you worked in the OHL. What was kind of the path? So after school, what was the first job? Was it the Hamilton Bulldogs? Correct. So during school, in order to become, in order to graduate and become certified as an athletic therapist, you need X amount of hours as an intern, and you do that during your schooling. So for the most part, you're working at clinics, or high schools around the GTA kind of thing, getting your hours, which is good. But I was lucky enough to get some more sought after ones. And one was a training camp experience with the Argos, Toronto Argonauts. And then at the same time in the same year um, with the Hamilton Bulldogs who were the AHL team of the Montreal Canadiens back then before they moved. Uh, so I did an internship two years there while still in school and then got hired when I graduated. And the same kind of happened with Argos. I did one season there as an intern and then I graduated and I worked the next year as a, as an assistant there. So my first two jobs were direct relation to two internships that I had. And I only did that one season each after that and then went right to the OHL. That's everything what they say, right? You do the you relationship, you do the first year of like intern building or whatever it is, yeah, yeah. relationship build, and then you're right in there the next year. So with the Hamilton Bulldogs, were you there when Carey Price was the goaltender? So Carey Price, a couple 
big names. Terry Price um, and Sue Ben, before he was traded, obviously, were there the year right before I came. And Max Pacioretty was there my first year. Um, but he was called up within a few months of being me being there, and he, was, he didn't come back down there. So, so that. So were you, um, were people in your class kind of jealous that you? Uh... Yes and no, I, I don't know. They're, you're allowed to apply for these uh, positions, but they're always, a teacher would always kind of uh, suggest a few to the, the person looking for the internship and, and not based on something necessarily, but if you know half the class wants to work in a clinic or wants to then why would they even try to get that experience right they knew all along i wanted to to try my shot at going into pro sports and maybe grades character person whatever a package of things and then that's how it kind of came about so toronto argonauts two seasons were you with them when uh, I see they have a successful 100th Grey Cup 2011. 2012. 2012. 2012. We won the Grey Cup in Toronto. Correct. I was there on the sidelines. So how was that? It was a pretty neat experience. Uh, it was my look at my first real gig out of high school. I was technically there's four therapists. So there was two more experienced, obviously the head and the assistant, and then me and another fellow graduate. Um, it, it was great. We, it was a long season. We, and we got to be at the Great Cup in Toronto. We got to stay at the hotel, just like anyone else, part of the team. All the practices, the, the atmosphere was hot, like, how many people? Thousands, 50,000 people there at the, the dome. Uh, it, was, it was great. I think it started snowing a little bit. We were down at some point. We played Calgary Stampeders. And uh, Justin Bieber was the halftime show. <laughs> it was great. That's a, oh, that's man. a memory, right? Oh, for sure. That sounds I, like a I, blast. I remember, sneaking, I remember sneaking out at half and making sure, like, okay, all the players didn't need treatment or anything. So I snuck out with the other therapist and we watched Justin Bieber. That's hilarious. And you know, I got uh, a ring for it. So. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. That's huge. Yeah. So is that that, because uh, I did some research and then I saw a pic and I think there's a pic where you're in a toque and you're kind of on the sidelines or something looking up and it looked like you're at a football stadium. Oh, no, I think you're talking about, that was with Hamilton. We had an outdoor game. Oh, okay. That was, I was on the bench for that. Um, that's, that's pretty sweet too. The, I didn't see that. Yeah. So we, that year, I was lucky enough to be a part of that in the AHL. It was at Iverwind Stadium, which is in Hamilton. And it was us versus Toronto Marley's, their, their farm team. So that was that. Gotcha. Well, it seems like you have a horseshoe up your ass, man, for hitting all these. Something. Uh, <laughs> you know, pedestals know. along the way or something yeah, like that. Something like that. Someone's looking out for me. I saw that you worked with Hockey Canada under 18. Um, the tournament there, um, 2015, 2016, 2017. Now, do you volunteer for something like that? Do you volunteer your time um, yeah. as a chance to maybe um, progress your career, meet more yep. people, that kind yep. of thing? That's exactly what it is. You, um, there's a kind of a portal to apply to their positions. Um, it starts at under 17. That was my first, my first one, and that was in Canada. And then there's a couple under 18 tournaments, and then under or 19 would be World Juniors. That's kind of the next step. And then you get into, if you're still with Hockey Canada, you could kind of have the shot at getting Olympics or world championships or something. That's if you're in the NHL, that's kind of a separate thing. But you do apply. Um, you have to be a member team, usually of like the OHL, WHL, or QMJHL. Um, send a resume, they call references. Um, that's about it. So yeah, I, and then I was lucky enough to get the under 17 job. And from there, they'll start kind of contacting you if for the next few to kind of work your way up. So I was fortunate enough to get, um, to get to go another two tournaments, both in Slovakia actually. So it was, it's a great experience. For sure. For sure. What's Slovakia like? What are the, would you stay in a hotel there or what was the situation yeah. like there? 
so um, it was just a coincidence that the two tournaments, totally different years I worked, were both hosted in Slovakia. One was in Bratislava, which is the uh, the major city. Like it's it's amazing. It's a big city. I think it's the capital. Um, really nice there. Nice people. Good food. We stayed at a really nice hotel. Uh, they have a they have a hockey team there in the Slovakian league. Like a, so, they had a good arena. Um, it's good. Europe is neat. And then you travel around to little cities and kind of play exhibition games, or you might have another host city that you go to, like in Croatia, because they're next to each other. Um, or sorry, Czech Republic. Um, and then my next tournament, I was in a smaller town in Slovakia. So was, the accommodations were, were different, but it's still nice. The, the city's happy to have you there. It's, it's, it's a neat experience for sure. Yeah. They do. You well. put in you put in your time uh, kind of the first year and then they kind of knew to call you did a good enough job and they knew to give you a shout for the next ones. And correct. And, and one of those are the world championships. It happens right during playoffs of the OHL. So you, your team has to be out basically or not made playoffs to go to it. So I, w I didn't make my playoffs in 2015 or 16, whatever it was. And they called me pretty much right away asking, like, hey, do you want to come to Slovakia with us for the under 18s? Of course, you don't say no too often. You, I mean, if you're having a child or some other family issues or whatever, maybe, but you, you just you do it. And it's, and it's worked out for me. And you mentioned, I work in the film business. You mentioned... Yep. Um, you know, you're staying, you're traveling, you're with the team, you're staying in hotels. You felt like you feel like you're part of the team. I Absolutely. know what it's like because when I do a road show, um, you know, you have upwards of 75 people working in the same crew, all different departments, mm -hmm. but staying in the mm -hmm. same hotel and road shows, you're kind of like this mini, mini family and the camaraderie. And before all these times that we're in now, like that's a lot of fun. Those experiences traveling on the road, going for dinner Absolutely. with everyone, being with yep. everyone, yep. you know, um, so I know with that sports in the film industry and there's certain industries that are kind of alike, uh, oh, yeah. in some regard to like that. And, and that's huge though, too. Like you could go on a road trip and spend time in the airplane, spend time, buses, hotels, team, like you said, and you, you seem to just you grow closer with each other. Right. That's all you see is the same 40, 50 people day in and day out, every hour you, you, you basically just sleep by yourself the rest of the time you're with them so you, you get to to learn to like them and you get it, it's good it's definitely good for team teamsmanship uh chemistry for sure there's times um because i'm sure it's the same way in sports in the film industry you're working upwards of 70 something hours a week it's not a Absolutely. regular nine to five office job you're working yeah. 70 80 hours a week sometimes um so you see these people more than your own family sometimes yeah yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's true. You went from Hamilton Bulldogs to Toronto Argonauts, doing some time with uh, Team Canada, and then you moved to head athletic therapist of the North Bay Battalion from 2013 to 2017. Correct. So the, the Hockey Canada stuff was during that time, too. It was basically... Gotcha. Yeah, you had to be in the OHL or other leagues like that to do that. So yes, I was the, the, the team moved from Brampton Battalion to North Bay that, that year, and the trainer and therapist didn't go with the team, so I was hired uh, for their inaugural season in North Bay. So that seems kind of like a nice step up for you. It seems like your first kind of starring role for That's, yourself. And I knew I needed that. I could have, I had the opportunity to be with the Argos again, but I was an assistant um and that actually overlapped the cfl season slightly overlaps the hockey season and don't get me wrong i like football but i want i knew i wanted hockey i grew up playing hockey as we discussed that's that's my life so i gave up the cfl gig uh reluctantly without having a job telling myself like if i need hockey it's got to be now that i do it and i can't be committed to cfl because I also didn't want to screw over my, my team in CFL and leave them maybe halfway through because I want to start hockey. So I quit cold turkey. Lucky, luckily, uh, North Bay job opened up. I knew I had to be ahead. They 
gave it to me and I became the therapist, equipment manager, and strength and conditioning coach. You're doing, uh, sounds like so much, but did you have a little bit of a team helping you too? How many people did I you had, have with you? Or? I had one assistant um, that just did equipment. So anything medical was on me, which I went to school for, which I was more than happy to do. I had to learn kind of the equipment side of it, which we had some courses in our kind of schooling, but not enough. But at trial by fire, I, I did it. I took a skate sharpening course, whatever. Um, it, it, it's rare to have that in the league. There was maybe five to six guys that were dual kind of therapist and equipment manager. And that's even gone down today. It might not even exist anymore. So I had, to answer your question, I did have an assistant equipment manager. And on game days, I had a couple of like younger kids help with bench setup and, and stuff like that. So it was manageable. I remember one interesting thing. Um, one of my dad's friends, my uncle Polly, coached with Teddy Nolan assisting in Buffalo. Okay. And uh, my dad told me a story one time that uh, sometimes it's not all as glitz and glam as it seems. He remembered hearing stories that my uncle Paul would sleep at the arena because he was the video guy, video oh, yeah. review yeah. guy. And, you know, you're working in the NHL, but like there's a lot of pressure and stuff like that to deliver and perform. And, and um, you know, it can be a very mentally exhausting and draining and whatever job to do that kind of stuff. And, and he's right. The, and don't get me wrong. The perks are awesome you get you get treated right and the players need that so you should but the hours you put in it's not for everyone you're right the, the time away from your family i have a wife and two kids um the time legit just at the rink when you know you could be doing something else whatever whether it's working out or a hobby something it just it doesn't happen and you know you have to wake up and do it early again the next morning it's it's it is taxing but you know what you're getting into. You would hope you know what you're getting into before you do it. And it, like I said, it's not for everyone. Absolutely. So with North Bay, how was it returning home? Because you had kind of been away, it seems, for a little bit. And I mean, I'm sure your family in the Sioux, are, is your family still in the Sioux? Yep, yep, they are. So I'm and sure they were happy closer. because they were a Absolutely. bit uh, closer. They probably got for to see sure. more games. Yeah, they, so not only did, that they visit us in North Bay a lot more because it was a four hour drive. Um, when we, we went to the Sioux to play too, a few times a year to the, for, for the Greyhounds, right? So they would always make sure they came and saw me. And if I stayed overnight, I'd go for breakfast or dinner or whatever, even just, just to see them for a little bit. So it, it, it was big for sure. They loved it. I loved it. It was, it was good. Did it open up your world to more friends that you didn't get a chance to see as well too? Yeah, no, just like I said, uh, going there, I, I had to get tickets for a few of my buddies almost every game in the suit for sure. Uh, <laughs> and I was got heckled or whatever. That's great. Whether it's, whether it's <laughs> Batonti or Decandia or, or Sarek, they're all there <laughs> making fun of me. So it was good. It was good to have some support. Obviously, the dream from the beginning was the NHL, right? Yes. Right from the so we, we will get there. So we're, we're just finishing up with North Bay. So you left the battalion and you started with the Calgary Flames affiliate. So how did, in Rockton, California, 2017 to 2019. So how did that, uh, did you how mean does that to say phone... Rock... Did you mean to Is say it Rockton? Rockton? It no, might've been uh, Stockton. So I typed yeah, in but... Stockton and it auto-corrected. No, that's fine. But a lot of people call it Rockton for some reason. So Unreal. I was like, does he know? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm deep in the know. We'll just go. You could you could edit this. And just be like, yeah, no problem. No, I'm leaving it in. Oh, okay, that's good. Good stuff. I'm Sorry, it what in. was the question? I uh, I left. How does that? Uh, how does a? So you left the battalion. Yeah. And you started with the Calgary Flames affiliate yes. in Rockton. Yes. Rockton, in Rockton, Stockton. In Rockton, Rockton, Stockton robots. Sure. And uh, how does that phone call go? And it seemed like not long after you got called up to work with the flames. Yeah. Um, um, so how does so the phone we, call go for, for battalion to flames? How did that Okay. Go? So we, once you're in professional hockey, but sort of uh, the WHL, OHL, that counts too. You join a, you tech, you don't have to, but there's a society it's called the Piats, uh, professional hockey trainers, athletic trainer society. 
So you're, you're part of a, a membership, you're part of a group, and it's only uh, NHL, AHL, NCAA, OHL, stuff like that, therapists and equipment managers. So with that, you get access to a website where you're a member of, where there's forums, and, um, directories, um, and, and job posting. So not all teams post on there. A lot of stuff is internal and like who you know or who they're willing to kind of seek out on their own. But every now and then you'll get um, you'll get a post in there. And I'm now actually saying that I'm not sure if Stockton was actually up, but I was in, I was told that their therapist was leaving. That's all I that's all I was told basically. So I was like, okay. Stocked in California, like how the heck am I gonna get there? I didn't even want to mention it to my wife because that's like literally on the west coast, so far from North Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, whatever. Um, but I knew at some point if I wanted to get hired, I have to go somewhere sometime. So I was just like, okay, let's just throw my name in the hat, whatever. Um sent my resume, found out the GM, sent my resume a couple weeks later, got a phone call and then it kind of ball time. I got rolling from there, got a phone call from the flames therapist, got a phone call from the GM of Stockton, set up kind of interviews, got interviewed again. It just, it happened over the summertime. And it was just kind of like with my wife, I was like, are we like legit, like if I get this job, are we legit thinking of going? Like we have to really sit down. Like that's, that's big. That's not just Sioux to Toronto. That's, that's across in another country. That's across. That's far. So I got, uh, I was offered the job. I kind of thought to myself, like, I kind of have to take it. If I know I'm going to want to go anywhere in life, you know, you never know when these jobs come up, first of all, and you never know when you're, you're going to be the one to be offered the job. So you take it. And luckily I have a wife that that was very willing to do whatever I needed basically to, to follow my dream. And we didn't have kids at the time. So it was, it was a no brainer. We kind of did like, cool, let's go live in California. So we did that. So what was that like? That, what is the Stockton Rockton uh, team called? Stockton heat. Heat. Flames, gotcha. Makes heat. sense. Flames. Kinda, heat. Yeah. yeah. Um, strange that they're in California. What's the reasoning for that? Um, Years ago, not many, I forget what year, uh, Brian Burke, you know, from hockey, was a big pusher. I don't know how he was involved. I forget the story, but he wanted a Pacific division in the AHL. I don't know if you were aware, the AHL used to be mostly mid-states to east coast. So they, they him along with us, some other people thought that their affiliate teams the people they call up, the people they have prospects on should be really close to them and rightfully so. So that meant teams like Vancouver, LA, uh, Calgary, you name any West Coast team, if they needed to call up someone, they were calling up someone from somewhere on the Eastern side of the States or Canada because that's where the AHL played. So they wanted to put an end to that because that could somehow not always make a player available for when they need it, right? So several years ago, five, six, I forget the exact date, they created, they moved a bunch of East Coast teams and AHL teams and they swapped them basically. So they, that created a lot more in the West, more AHL teams. So the, the places that had East Coast teams, uh, like Stockton had a team called Stockton Thunder, uh, stuff like that, uh, Ontario Reign, they became AHL teams. And that was the birth of the Pacific Division. So there's four or five teams in California, Arizona, stuff like that. So that was the people you played most. So after making this huge decision to move to California, from what I'm reading, it seems like it was a very short time before you get called up to the Flames. It was two, two full seasons. Two full I was seasons. The head, yeah, I was the head trainer there for two seasons. Um, and you work, you, you, get to, you get to know the NHL guys. Obviously, you go to training camp. They bring you to training camp because a lot of those players might go to Stockton or Flames kind of interchangeable. Um, so you, I go to Calgary every training camp. Um, 
I have to send an injury report to the Flames management and, and coaches and therapy staff every day about what was going on. Down. So you're, you're in close kind of connection with them. So I got to know them well. And, and after two seasons, a spot opened up basically uh, up where I am now. And uh, they, they wanted me up here. So it was good. So was that kind of... I don't know, a huge moment for you? Like you feel like you get your call to the NHL and you feel like it's a huge stepping stone? Yeah, I do. It was, uh, I wasn't expecting it. Um, the position, basically the, the title was a little different than what I was kind of um, looking for, but I knew it was an in to the NHL. And like I mentioned before, those jobs don't come too often. And you, you, you take it, you take what's given for you to you and, and you do it. Um, and it's a bonus that it's back in Canada. So my, my family's happy, uh, a little closer to home, a couple hours difference versus California, but nonetheless, it was the right decision and I was happy it happened. So this is what I was kind of asking. So you said it was great for your career. You're in the NHL. It's a lifelong dream to work in professional sports. It's the next step up. Is that kind of a pinch me moment? Like when are you walking into that? Like once you're in the NHL and you're stepping into all these different arenas that you've idolized and seen all these players, I guess that you've been, uh, you're pretty much the same age as now, but seeing them don the jerseys that just the jerseys like hockey. I used to have hockey cards growing up. You know, we used to have play hockey in the driveway as all these players and wearing the jerseys and everything. Called who you were. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So like, what was that like stepping into these arenas? It's, it's, it is me. It's surreal for sure. You, you, you can't show that you can't be, can't be a fanboy, and like, be like, well, I know that player is like an all-star. Blah, blah. You have to, you get used to it at first. Sure. You're kind of starstruck, whatever. The arenas, the players, the, the, um, the amenities you get and have, and have as an NHL versus especially the leagues that I've been in. But uh, you, you kind of get over that quick and you're there for a job and you have to. And I know there's, uh, you hear of not horror stories, but you hear of other guys that don't get past that part and they don't last long in the league. And there's a reason for that. You're, you're, you, can't, you can't, but don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say I wasn't excited or love it, but it's just, you, you have that moment and but you get over it. And you know you're there for a reason and you belong there and it's nice it's the same way in film because you have actors and and there's some people who are just such kiss asses that they're too annoying kind right. of thing you know and there's yeah. other people who are just like they treat them like like they would treat anyone else and it's just exactly. we're all here to just to work we all exactly. just have different departments or whatever and that's what you're looking for exactly so training and medical staff with the flames you're the assistant athletic therapist mm-hmm. um life in the bubble uh this is kind of what spawned me wanting to have you on the show because zucker was like oh yeah Brelli's working for the flames because i was um dallas i'm a fan of dallas yeah and uh you know i wasn't gonna wear the jersey or anything tonight (laughs) but uh, but i've got a few more of these if we start talking about anyways (laughs) but so like that one must have been such a crazy experience so what was that like for you it was an experience. That's, that's the best way to put it. It was uh, very unique. Um, no one's ever going to experience that pro- probably in their life, hopefully, because that means there's another kind of pandemic or something going on. Uh, it was crazy. There was, everything was by the book. You were, you were literally, I hate to say, but at, at times it felt like you were like in a penitentiary. You, you walked to the same area to get to where you got to go you stay in the same room you you had a yard so to speak where like outside it was it was like a just a fenced in area of concrete and like don't get me wrong the nhl did it great they did they obviously we had zero positive tests it was successful good viewership good games it was it was hard it was tough being away from family uh i know that for the players and everything but at the same time it, it was it was fun it was interesting experience you had to fill your time with with different things each day whether it was hanging out with your staff or going to golf simulators or working out every day uh just spending some extra time in the dressing rooms or whatever it was it was good i know the boys loved it too they they got a lot of 
uh, together time, a lot of uh, social time, just hanging out, whether it's having a few beer or having a dinner, watching a game, whatever it was. So I know they like that experience, that side of it too. But it was a lot of logistical work for sure. It, it wasn't a vacation like some people on like the internet thought it would be with luxurious restaurants and pools and this and that. It, it was a lot of work. I would say it seemed like they handled it great. Like obviously for sure. Kudos things for aren't going to be perfect or whatever, but they were, I think they set the precedent because right. every other place was still having cases and they just right. kind of powered right through and, and made they it They did well. So. We, we tested every single day. Your throat got raw, but you know what? To be safe, it, it, was, it was good. It was the right thing to do. What do you think your, um, you would say like one great positive memory you would take from it? What was like one great thing that happened in there for you, whether it was just like, it's hard to say a delicious, uh, an amazing meal or something or something, but what, even if it was just like a great laugh with the boys or something. There's a few of those. Um, <laughs> I honestly, I honestly think just, I know it sounds cheesy, but just being there, like I said, how many people could say they were in the bubble? Each team is only allowed to bring 52 people, I think. And that includes 30 players. So if you're, you're lucky enough to go there, you're, you're obviously a uh, service to the team and you're needed. And it was, it was an honor to be there. It was cool. Everyone says the COVID cup or whatever, and they're like, you're part of that. So that was, that's a big thing. Um, but yeah, there was definitely a few, few nights where you got to kind of relax and, and spend some time with whether it's some of the, some of the players or the, the other uh, teammate or sorry, your other colleagues. It, it was good. Working with the Flames, how many, you have like a team of eight or something? It must be a massive team of, of people that you're working with at that level. So therapy-wise, like um, athletic therapy, there's, there's four of us. Um, three of us travel. Like we're all, obviously we do all the home stuff. Three of us travel, I'm included in that. The fourth one usually stays home to rehab anyone who's um, not able to, to travel or who's had surgery or this or that or deal with the other stuff. So there's four of us day-to-day -day dealing with all the injuries. Then there's two strength and conditioning coaches and another three equipment managers. So, so does the guy who's... Who stays so, home rotate? Does the guy who stays home rotate depending on, no, or is it always no. one same person? It's it's yeah, it's him. It's always him, and he's he's also in charge of more so rehabbing any long, like I said, long term injuries, say like surgeries, and any prospects maybe that are on other teams still, like in the OHL that we drafted, or in the AHL. He he coordinates and kind of and makes sure everything's going smoothly with that too. But he's also okay. there helping us on day to day. Now, where would you watch the games from when you're there? Right, like uh, behind the scenes, behind the bench in the dressing yep. room, or? Yeah. So I'm the, obviously there's there's the the head therapist and the 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 lead assistant. I'm basically like under them. Um, so if those two are on the bench. We always have two on the bench. But I'm usually in the tunnel, basically, helping out. I, I also I don't mind um, sometimes players need gloves switched or something, or I'll run back and, and help the equipment managers switch some gloves. Or sometimes if the equipment managers are busy, I'll man the sticks and someone breaks the sticks, I'm, I'm getting it. But also if there's injuries that one of the trainers on the bench have to go off for, I'll hop up on the bench and help kind of cover that. So I'm kind of just like a rover when it comes to games, but I also don't have to be out there. It's, it's helpful that I'm out there, but, I could also sit and watch in the dressing room if I really, really wanted to. You know what I mean? I guess uh, not to bring up a negative moment, but there was a, a crazy moment, I would say. Um, I guess it was what, maybe last year? TJ Brody collapsed on the ice and convulsing situation during practice. What was that yeah. situation like? That was, it was freaky. Um, practice is so routine. You just, you, you don't think anything is going to happen. You think if something emergency like is going to happen it'll be in a game situation not to say that we weren't prepared but it's just you're more you're more kind of your guards kind of let down in practice you're, you're you're watching you're joking around you're having fun but we're also we're out there for that reason so our main job 
when we're watching practice, we're, we're first responders and we, we always have at least one of us watching the bench whenever someone's on the ice. So that's, that's a given. So luckily I was out there and, and Mike via the assistant therapist were, we're both out there and it's without telling, I don't know, I don't know how much I could tell, but he, he was kind of feeling like a little different. He's saying, we're just like, okay, well like, take it easy. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't anything crazy. And then like a couple minutes later, I'm staring out there and I see him kind of like get a little wobbly and then go down and, and Mike was looking the other way and I, tap Mike and like I think we should go and he's like what and we're like oh crap so we both get out there Mike darts out there first so me and me and him are both on the scene and it's 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 scary you you're trained for this um you know what to do first if luckily he was breathing he had a heart he had a pulse all the things checked which was good we weren't going nuts for anything um he was basically having a seizure. So we, we our train kicked in and we, we dealt with it uh, accordingly. Um, we got the MS there eventually and, and he ran through a gamut of tests, like heart, brain, you name it. And the next few weeks he just kind of relaxed and recuperated. And it, it was uh, it was scary for sure. And the players were affected big time too. We had to, we canceled practice. Everyone, some of the guys went to the hospital after. It was a kind of a big day. It was taxing on us. I read the article. It really seemed like it commended you guys on like your quick acting and um, just your expertise and training and everything like that. Well, like every, we, yeah, we were, we were recertified every few years. That's required, but we as, NHL therapists do it almost every off season and, and we hold ourselves to a high standard because these, these guys trust us for anything that happens. And when that kind of stuff happens, you, you want to be prepared. And luckily, like I said, there's four of us each preseason, we get together, we take a course again, even though we've taken it hundreds of times, it seems we go through scenarios, even on the ice and we practice that. And we practice, our docs are there, we practice that. We invite DMS there, we, we practice it. So when the time comes, and if it comes, and hopefully it never comes, but it did this year, we're ready. So yeah, it, it was good that we were able to respond and, and help TJ out. Yeah, because you've got you've to practice it so much because it's such a panic or possibly panic scenario that it's got to be That's, so quick. Quick acting that it just kind of kicks in rather than even thinking about it. That's the thing. We, I, I remember players kind of panicking. Coaches are like, what do we, you know what I mean? Like, I get that, obviously. But, like, this is what we are hired for, essentially. So let us kind of do our thing, and it's, it's all under control. So the amount of injuries in football versus hockey um, and the amount of staff available per player is kind of crazy. Like, yeah. Uh, so I'm, you obviously have a bigger roster in football, especially in, yeah, you have a bigger roster, you have full defense, full offense, special teams, whatever, versus uh, 23 guys, say, on a roster at in the NHL. But oddly enough, I had four therapists with the CFL and the Argos and also four therapists in the NHL. So you could see there's maybe some parity in, in salary, obviously, and, and, and revenue. Obviously, the NHL is bigger than the CFL, so you're able to have more staff. But, yes, injuries seem to be kind of rampant in football, for sure. You, you'll get lots. Every play, there's pretty much something, for sure. It, is, it was different. Now, one thing that people probably don't understand is when you get hired – for something like this, the amount of pressure that you're under to kind of perform um, the same way an athlete would be. So it's like pressure from players, coaches, management, and not yeah, bad yeah. pressure, but just pressure yeah. because they're relying on you for Absolutely. your expertise. Um, they, they don't know what the problem is. You do, you know, um, identifying the injury, um, relieving aches, providing proper nutrition. Um, like you said, um, uh, rehabilitation is a huge thing. Like they really rely on you and are investing in you to, to know this stuff. Right. So you have to be, you have to be confident in, 
in your your timelines, your rehab, your um, how, how you know each player is going to react to certain injuries, and and you have to be able to communicate that. You also obviously have good doctors that are right there with us too, helping us out, backing us up. Um, but you you have to answer to coaches and management and other players and the player sitting in front of you too. It, it's a lot of pressure. You, sometimes they think one thing versus what you think, whether they think they could go back out and we're like, no, or the opposite where they're like, I'm going to die. This is the worst. And we're like, no, we're, we're doing all of our tests. You're solid. It might hurt, but you're safe. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, there's a lot of responsibility, but if you're confident in your, your, your work and your knowledge, then you gain that kind of trust with the staff and the players and, and they rely on you as they should. If the players go through physical and mental exhaustion, which they all do, um, we were talking about the amount of hours and the amount of work and stuff that you have to put in. So you, as the therapist, you're also going through that because you're, you're taking all their stuff too, all their pain and everything, all their information and, and their timelines. You, um, so how do you handle that day-to-day -day needing to you, cure? You, yeah, you're right. You, they... They talk to you. They tell you what's on their mind at all time. They they'll congregate in the therapy room and talk. Uh, it's almost like it's it's a gathering place. And when you have an injury, and you're talking to someone, even if it's just maintenance kind of stuff. They'll they'll tell you what's going on. And you have to be positive, obviously. You have to be realistic, but positive. They're they're not. They only know one thing. They want to play, right? So if they're out or not feeling 100 percent you have to kind of back up their mental side and kind of uh, like reassure them or just, you know, push them or, or whatever you, you do. And you learn some of that stuff. You, you take sports psych and stuff and you learn more about kind of dealing with them as you get experience. And you also learn what each player is like too. Some players tolerate more than others. So you, you got to learn how to kind of, to which, which kind of avenue to go down when you're dealing with them and, and how to respond appropriately, basically. That's excellent, man. Well, we've pretty much reached uh, most of my questions other than uh, one left, of course, of like, what do you think is next? What's going on um, with, with uh, the Flames? I don't know if you can talk about it, but is the plan to return with the Flames for the upcoming NHL season? Yeah, so I, I do have another contract with them. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm basically, there's there's four of us, and I'm the third, essentially. Um, my goal is to not be that low the whole time. So if I have, I, I, love, I love this place. I love the team. I love my colleagues. They've given me the shot here. You name it. But I, I want to keep going higher. So I want to be the assistant. Like the, there's, there's always a head, an assistant, and one or two kind of third like assistant, assistant. You know what I'm saying? Yep. They're all part of the team, but say the head's gone, then the, then the assistant's like in charge. You know what I mean? There's, there's a hierarchy. So right now, I'm, I still want to climb. So if at some point in the near future, a spot opens up, whether it's here or somewhere else in the NHL, I hope I'm looked at for it. I hope I can get it. Um, if it the fits right for me in, in the move, if there is a move for my family, um, then I'll have to consider it, obviously. But if not, I'm, I'm happy here. And if they're happy to keep bringing me back, I'll, I'll keep going. It's a little bit uh, kind of like the film world I was mentioning. It's a little bit of a gypsy lifestyle because it's not yeah, like you 100%. Get to, uh, you're not like really getting traded or whatever, but you're, get, you're just moving around from place to place. Wherever, city to wherever city the work and... is. Yep. Absolutely. Like you That's said, awesome, Daniel. man. North Bay, I've been in California and I'm in Calgary. So if, if nothing opens up here in the next little bit to move up and I feel like going elsewhere and I'm fortunate enough to do so, then it's going to be another city. So I'll add that to, to my life too. So who, who knows? The, the future's up in the air. Well, before we go, man, there's one thing that we do here. It's a little segment that uh, uh -oh. once we reach the end, I like to call the gauntlet. Uh-oh. Rapid and fire? You Good yeah, pretty time. much fast money. Pretty much okay. fast money. Just, uh, you know, the best answer that comes to mind kind of thing. Okay. So, James, where does the time go? Out the window. What shape is the sky? Round. 
Which apocalyptic dystopia is the most possible? Zombies, cannibals, Black Mirror, Hunger Games, or Mad Max? Hunger Games. And now which apocalyptic dystopia do you think you would thrive in the most? Cannibalism? <laughs> That's weird. Why are we here? To... In, we're in the pursuit of happiness. What does the world need most? Love. Isn't there a song about that? Like what Austin Powers. The what the world there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, needs back now <laughs> is love. There Sweet love. See? But it, it actually needs a cure. Or vaccine. But it was Absolutely. a lot of fun. I wish you all the all the best. Um, the you. progression of your career is a lot of fun to watch. And I'll obviously keep uh, following it. And just, uh, I appreciate you know, that. even though I'm a Stars fan, you know, I'll be rooting for you for the Flames. Uh, yeah, anytime. we should have won. Anyways, well, was, uh, honestly, thank you very much. Uh, it's been fun, for, for sure. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm just going to sign off here and just stick around after I sign off here. And so James face? Borelli... No, you know what? That's one thing. That's one thing that I don't have you stay as a classy, sign out. Toronto. <laughs> I, I haven't. Uh, I'm gonna stick with the uh, the no catchphrase. No. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and just leave it and just leave it at that until I come up with something, you know, that I actually want to say that doesn't Word sound time. fake. Yep. I don't want to sound fake. That's the biggest thing with this with this podcast. So. I get it. Okay, do your thing. And uh, that's all, folks. <laughs> that's original. <laughs> Anyways, that's it, everyone. So thank you to my guest, James Borelli. We had a lot of fun. And I uh, hope you enjoy the episode. <laughs>